Hey everyone, Jeffrey here. And if you want to have the power to really manage your own emotions and break that cycle of arguing and fighting with your partner once and for all, then watch till the end of this video for my five most practical tips that you can use to really become bulletproof and have total control of your emotions. And for the best, most practical, and most actionable tips that you can use in your own relationship or your marriage, then subscribe to this channel and click that bell button to be notified whenever I post a new video every Wednesday and every Saturday. Hey everyone, Jeffrey here. And for those of you who don't know me, my mission here with this channel is to empower as many people as possible to really understand and to really thrive in their relationship. And if you're currently struggling to manage your own emotions in your relationship and it's causing a lot of issues here and there, then by the end of this video, you will have five new tips that you can try immediately to regain control of those emotions. And I've taught these five tips to many of my clients over the years. And when they learn this stuff, it can really help them to reframe a lot of the thinking in their own head a lot of the way they think about life and just events around them. And once they reframe their thinking like this, it can really help them control their emotions and stop all those anger issues and all those intense emotions that gets out of control. And so the first thing to understand before we begin is the nature of how emotions form in the first place. Emotions don't form from their actual events. So we could have, for example, an external event. So the external event could be that we got fired, or maybe it could be a completely internal event. So for example, we're sitting on our couch, nothing is really happening, but we're thinking of all these negative things in our head that makes us very negative. But it's not those things that's making it negative. It's not the external event, the fact that we got fired or us thinking about bad stuff. And this is actually a good thing because, you know, we can't always control the events that happen around us. We can't always control whether a negative thought pops into our head or not. We can't control if we get fired or not. But what we can control 100% is how we interpret those events. And so the five tips you're going to hear from me today are all about how to reframe these mental interpretations and not how to change the events around us. So let's talk about why managing or controlling your emotions is so, so crucial when it comes to relationships. And I'm sure we're all familiar with this feedback loop cycle in your own relationship. So for example, your partner gets angry, then your partner being angry often makes you angry, but then you being angry makes your partner angry. And you perpetuate this negative cycle. And before you know it, your guys are fighting and arguing and, and everything's out of control. But here's the thing. If you can control your emotions, that's almost like wearing a bulletproof vest for yourself. So your partner could be angry, upset, and crazy. But if you can control your own emotions, you understand how to control those mental interpretations, then you're almost wearing this bulletproof vest. And you can stand graceful. You can stand calm in the face of those intense emotions. And what happens here is that you can now break the cycle because you're not perpetuating the cycle where your partner's angry, then you get angry, then your partner's angry again. But now you can turn it into something very positive, actually. So for example, in my own arguments, you know, my partner sometimes gets mad. I get mad too. But for example, in this case, my partner gets mad. And when I see my partner being so intensely emotional like that, I don't panic because I understand what those emotions mean. I understand how to interpret those emotions. And because I'm calm, I can do the right things to make my partner calm. And what happens is that if this repeats a lot, you can always turn bad moments into good moments. And if you do this enough, you will start to create this culture, this beautiful environment in your relationship where your partner can know that they can rely on you. Your partner can feel like uh, this relationship is a safe haven for them. And usually they will actually make him calmer just in general, in the long run, and makes it much, much easier for you in the long run. But if you keep perpetuating the cycle and you keep arguing and every time your partner gets angry, it turns into this war, then you're gonna be fighting a lot and things are gonna be degrading very, very fast. So with these five tips, I'm gonna teach you how to be bulletproof in this session. Because really being bulletproof and really controlling and managing those emotions can be not only the most important thing you do in your relationship, but also the most important thing you do in life, period. And tip number one is start building positive mental habits. And so most people think that anger and when you're very emotional as a person, that's an issue of character. But I can tell you that it's not an issue of character. But I always find that it's an issue of habits. And how do I know this? Because I had major, major anger issues myself. You know, I was the one in my family who was dubbed as the person with a short fuse, who had the temper issues, and everyone just had to watch out around me all the time because you never know what would trigger me. And everyone, my dad, my mom, my sister, uh, my friends were telling me, hey, that's just how you were wired. That's just your hormones. You're just born that way. But I found that that's not true at all. How do I know? Because I used to have major anger issues and now I don't have any of those issues anymore because emotions are really a product of your mental habits, not your character. And just like any habits, if you want to change your habits, we need to nurture the good and starve the bad. 
And you have to do both here. So a lot of people, when they're trying to uh, build positive habits, they try to nurture the good only. So they listen to all these motivational videos, they listen to all these positive things, but they never starve the bad. They never starve the negative things that are in their life right now. And some people just starve the bad and don't nurture the good. So they take out all the negative things, but they don't do anything positive. And most people do neither. And when it comes to nurturing the good and starving the bad, you don't have to do this 24 seven. And I think the misconception that a lot of people have is that to really control your thoughts, to really make yourself positive, you have to be positive 24 seven. There are actually just a few key moments in your day that you need to pay attention to that when you optimize these times, it can really, really make a huge difference for the rest of your day. So ask yourselves right now, what do you do during these key moments? What do you do when you wake up or go to sleep? Is the first thing you do checking your email, checking social media, or just worrying about what's going to happen throughout your day? When you're stressed, what do you do? Do you tend to perpetuate the stressful thoughts or do you try to stop it? When you go home, do you complain about your work? Do you whine about your work? Do you complain about how tired you are, how tough your day was, or do you say something positive? When you're relaxing, when you're watching TV, when you're hanging out with your friends, what kind of stuff do you talk about? What kind of stuff do you watch? Are there stuff that inspire you, energize you? Or are you not even thinking about what you're doing when you're relaxing? And what do you do during the mindless moments? So when you're driving, when you're at the toilet, at the pooper, in those moments that you're not really doing anything, your, your mind can really wander. What are you thinking of? What are you listening to? Are you controlling those thoughts or are you just kind of letting it wander? And the main question really is, do you consciously nurture the good and starve the bad during these moments? Because most people don't consciously know what they're doing there. And they might from time to time, you know, sometimes they might actually do the right thing. They might stop themselves from checking their email or worrying about work in the morning. Um, they might stop themselves from complaining about their work once they get home. They might stop trying to choose the negative news or the negative media or the negative ways of relaxation and choose something more positive, but they're not being deliberate about it. They're not being conscious about it. So it's kind of a hit and miss and you can't make anything a habit if you're not conscious about it. And so if you're having some emotional issues here, if you're having some very intense emotions within you, some very pent up stuff and you can't control it and you are not very conscious of what you do during these moments, or you're not deliberate about nurturing the good and starving the bad during these key moments, then you really have your answer because you haven't trained your mental habits. So look at this list right now. If you want, pause the video and write it down. And I want you to come up with one new thing in one of those key moments that either nurtures the positive or starves the negative. And once you pick that one thing, make it a habit for 30 days. Do it every day for 30 days. Then you want to pick another habit that nurtures the positive or starves the negative, And you continue the cycle over and over again. And you want to think of this like building blocks. You're collecting all these habits that either nurture the positive or starts the negative. So pick one, master that for 30 days, then pick another one, master that, and so on and so on and so on. And if you keep doing this, imagine how many new positive habits, and imagine how different you will think, imagine how different you will be when you keep adopting all these positive habits. I can tell you that you'll be completely different because now you're not leaving all those split second emotional reaction up to chance. Why? Because you've trained it. Your mind is just made up of a bunch of mental habits here. And sometimes your mind just have a habit of reacting in this way or thinking in this way or interpreting things in a certain way. But when you start to reframe those habits one by one, you start to change the nature of those split second reactions from something that is negative to something that's positive. So for example, for me, when I wake up, the first thing I do when I wake up is I don't check my phone. I never look at social media. I never look at my emails. All I do is I turn to my partner and I give her a kiss. And when I look across my bed, all I see are just motivational posters, motivational quotes. Once I get out of bed, the first thing I do is I meditate. And the second thing I do is I watch one motivational video. Then I hop in the shower. And when I'm showering, I'm thinking about all these motivational videos. When I'm stressed, the habit that I have is to either meditate if I have time, or if I'm in a meeting or something like that and I can't meditate then, I would just practice breathing. And when I go home from work, no matter how crazy work was, no matter how bad that day was, I could have lost a lot of money. When I go home, the first thing I do is I talk to my partner and spin everything in a positive way. Even if something was really shit, I would spin it in a positive way where I say, you know, here's what I learned from that experience. When I'm relaxing, I never watch news. I never watch anything negative. I always ask myself when I watch something, when I hang out with a friend, how did that make me feel? Did it make me feel more energized, more inspired or worse? And if it makes me feel worse, I'm never going to do that thing again. So when I'm relaxing, I'm only watching positive stuff, inspirational stuff and motivational things. That's it. And during the mindless moments that I have, like when I'm driving or sitting in the toilet, I'm either meditating during those times 
or practicing my breathing during those times too. And all these things that I do, it took me years to cultivate all those habits. But those habits are the ones that really got rid of my anger issues because now all my mental habits are tuned the right way. And so whenever something happens, my instant reaction is not to panic, but actually to be calm and do all the positive things that I nurtured. So ask yourself right now, what new habit are you going to try that really nurtures the positives or one that starves the negative? So leave a comment below and let me know. We'd love to hear your thoughts here. And number two, when you're intensely emotional, the first thing you should do is something called affect labeling. And so if you look at the cross section of our brain here, there's two parts of our brain that really matters. There's one part of our brain called the prefrontal cortex, and this is responsible for higher level thinking, uh, planning, or other complex behaviors. So this is what makes humans smart. But then there's another part of the brain called the amygdala, and this is a more primal part of the brain where all emotions are basically processed. And so whether you're talking about happy emotions or negative emotions, all emotions are processed here. And all it means when we're emotional, when we're angry, is that our amygdala is more active, is overactive compared to our prefrontal cortex. That's it. And so all we need to do when we're emotional is to understand how can we get that activity down? All the signals that's firing in the amygdala, how can we get it down? And researchers have been studying this for decades now. And what they found is that the best thing to do to calm that activity in the amygdala is to put your emotions into words, which is basically what affect labeling is. So whenever you can, whenever you're angry, either say this to yourself just out loud or say it to your partner. I feel blank. And if you find it hard to say something here, just understand that this doesn't need to be a big deal. You can just say, I feel good or I feel bad. The important thing is that you just say it. And the thing is that even if you just start off by saying, I feel blank, I feel bad or I feel good, something vague like that. As you do this, what you're doing is you're building that emotional awareness within you. And then a month into it, six months into it, you can actually begin to understand your emotions better. And when you understand your emotions better, you can say more specific and more detailed things, which then it will work even better for you. And number three, this one is really, really big and nobody talks about this one, but this is really, really crucial. You need to blame systems and environments, not people. And so imagine that you're sitting in this blue car right now. Someone in front of you is speeding really, really fast. Uh, they're not using the blinkers. You know, they're just driving like an asshole. The first thing you're going to think most of the time is, gosh, what a dick. But never would you think, I wonder what is going on that he is in such a rush. So the first thing you think of when you see someone doing something you don't like is you blame character. But the funny thing is that think about the last time you were driving recklessly. Was it due to some environment? For example, you're late for a meeting, you need to go to the hospital, you know, some emergency is happening, or are you just an asshole? Most of the time you're going to say it's always due to some environment. So see the bias here. Whenever someone else is doing the asshole-ish things, you blame character. But if you're doing it, you're doing it because of some environment. And this bias happens so often. It's such an ingrained part of our brain that scientists call it the fundamental attribution error. And what we need to understand is that when we blame people, one is that it makes issues more personal. What it does is it makes the other person feel very attacked. And when the other person feels attacked, your partner, they will get their guard up, their defenses go up, and they're gonna be very defensive making it impossible for you to have any good conversation anymore. And two is that it makes you feel kind of overwhelmed. Why? Because when you blame people, when you blame character, character is something that is hard to change. So for example, I work with a lot of people who, you know, they claim that their partner is very emotionally unavailable and they think that that's just who they are. And so they blame their closeness on the fact that that's just who their partner is. They're just emotionally unavailable. They blame character. But that makes people feel very overwhelmed because if you believe that your partner is really emotionally unavailable, that's just who they are, what can you do? It makes you feel overwhelmed just thinking about how to change that because character is so hard to change. But when people start to understand that, hey, they're not just emotionally unavailable, something in their life is causing them to feel that way. What you need to do is to understand what that is and change their environment and system so that they stop feeling that way. And once they do that, they feel a lot better. Because environments and systems, you can always change that very quickly. But character is really hard to change. So when you blame someone's character, you're making yourself feel overwhelmed for no reason already. And number three is that when you blame people, it keeps your focus on blaming, which makes both of you really, really miserable. And the thing is that when you're blaming character, your brain is already in the wrong mode. It's not trying to discover anything. It's just focused on blaming. And what it does is that once you focus on blaming, you make your partner defensive. They say something to blame you then you get defensive, then you say something back to blame them and then cycle just continues again. And number four, the last one, is it creates a lot of defensiveness and bitterness. If your partner keeps telling you that you are emotionally unavailable, 
that you are an angry person, that you have all these flaws of character, is that encouraging or discouraging? It's actually very discouraging, actually very sad. And if you do that enough to your partner, your partner will stop seeing the relationship as something that is good. They're going to see the relationship as a source of grief, a source of discouragement for them, a place where they're labeled as emotionally unavailable, angry, whatever. So don't do this. There's nothing good that can come out of blaming people. Nothing. But when you start to focus on changing environments, then everything changes here. Because one, it externalizes the issue. And why is this important? When you externalize an issue, it's easier to become more calm and more creative to fix the issue. So for example, when I'm working with my clients and I'm addressing their issues, it's easier for me to be objective, to be calm when dealing with those issues. But when it comes to dealing with the same issues within my own relationship, it suddenly becomes a lot harder. And I'm sure you guys have felt this many times also. And number two is that it fosters understanding and openness because it's really easy to blame flaws in character. We do it all the time, but when we start to point our blame to an environment, what happens is that it now becomes kind of silly to blame the environment. You know, it becomes silly to blame like rain, to blame systems that are really out of control. And so when you begin to shift your blame from blaming people to blaming environments, a funny thing happens, which is that your brain just switches. It switches from blaming to the discovery mode because blaming environments seems silly. And number three is that it feels hopeful because environments are easy to change. Once you identify the problem with the environment, you can change it tomorrow if you want. But even if you find a flaw in character, you cannot change it tomorrow. It takes years to change that. And the last one, this kind of ironic, is that it also changes character. And there's a lot of studies done on this that where, you know, when you put people in a very violent environment, they become violent as well. But when you put people in a non-violent environment, they become non-violent. And so our environment totally has a bearing on our character. So the funny thing is that if you change the environment, it actually changes character much faster and much easier than trying to change character directly. And if you still don't see the connection here of how blaming environments can help you calm down, just go back to this example again. So which of these responses will make you feel more calm? I can bet you it's the one on the right, which is when you blame environment and you say, I wonder what is going wrong that he's in such a rush. And which one gets you into discovery mode? Same answer. And the thing is that even if it's a people problem, there are usually environmental based solutions. And if you can't find it, you're not looking hard enough. That's all. And you want to apply this to yourselves too. So don't blame yourselves. Seek to change the environment around you. So if you have anger issues, don't blame yourself for having those anger issues. Look at your life, look at your environment and seek to change the environment around you. So now ask yourself, what is something in your relationship that makes you angry, that makes you really upset? And once you find that thing, ask yourself, how can you reframe your questioning to blame environments, not people? Watch how your brain and your whole mental process change when you start to make this shift. Number four is to change your expectations on emotions. And again, we know this cycle that can perpetuate. And so what we need to do is we need to make ourselves bulletproof in the face of intense emotions because we need to break that cycle. And we also know that our emotions are not caused by the events itself, but our mental interpretations, which are very subjective. And the thing is that there's two things that can determine how we interpret an event at a given point. And again, it's these two parts of our brain, the prefrontal cortex and our amygdala. And these two parts are always in a tug of war. And the prize they're fighting for are your thoughts, interpretations, and decisions. And most often, hopefully, our prefrontal cortex wins. So usually this is when we can think logically and wisely about something. But remember that when we're very emotional, what happens is that our amygdala is overactive. It's being more powerful than that prefrontal cortex. So it wins the tug of war here. And if we understand all these things, then we can also understand that the nature of our emotions is that is very subjective. So if you put a hundred people in the same room, seeing the same thing, experiencing the same things, they're going to have a hundred different emotions because emotions are subjective because the interpretations are subjective. It's also irrational. You know, often we feel sad when we're supposed to feel happy and we feel happy when we're supposed to feel sad. It's just the way emotions work. So to give you an example here, um, when I first started this business, I had my first speaking gig ever. It was for a TEDx event. And usually that would be a very good thing that happens. I should feel very happy about that. But that was not how I interpreted the event. I got really scared. I got really depressed and I got really doubtful of myself. And I started to feel like shit because of that. The interpretations that I had was irrational. And those irrational interpretations made my emotions irrational as well. And emotions also tend to be perpetual. I mean, just think about how difficult it is to get someone out of a negative rut. You can say the most positive things, you can say the most enlightening things, but somehow they twist and they bend that positive thing to make it negative. Because negative emotions tend to beget more negative emotions. And conversely, 
positive emotions tend to beget even more positive emotions. And they can also degrade very quickly. And so you could just be sitting on your couch and you could replay that one thought, the negative thought in your head, and that negative thought leads to another negative thought, and so on and so on and so on. And within five minutes, you can go from being happy to being miserable. You know, when I first started this business, I had a lot of those moments where I would just be sitting on my couch watching TV, then one thought would pop into my head of some criticism that someone gave me. Then that one negative thought leads to another one and another one and another one. Before you know it, by the time the TV show ends, I'll be miserable. And the last one is that it's complex and very multi-layered. Whenever you're emotional, intensely emotional, whenever you're angry, it's not just one thing, it's a complex web of many things. And what most people do is they try to mind read emotions, they try to analyze it, they try to fix it, or they try to change it and force the other person to calm down. When you do this, this almost always gets interpreted the wrong way and almost always gets the other person more mad, your partner more mad. And usually what happens is that your partner will shut down and walk away or they blow up. Or if they don't shut down or walk away or blow up, you will notice that a lot of your trying to analyze, trying to fix it, doesn't actually work. They still stay negatively emotional. And I'm sure you've walked away from many of these interactions thinking like, what the hell? How can you be so difficult? What the hell? And usually what happens is this makes you even more mad, which then again makes your partner even more mad. And the cycle continues. We know this cycle very well. So the solution will start changing your expectations or emotions. And you need to start expecting emotional people to be very intense. So don't be surprised when, you know, emotional people can be happy one moment, then five minutes later, they can be very negatively intense. The emotions can all perpetuate internally and it tend to perpetuate itself. And until you understand this, until you understand that emotions can always be intense and it can be such a large swing, until you understand this, you can never master emotions. And don't think that your partner is the only one doing this. You do the exact same thing when you're emotional as well. And also expect emotional people to be inarticulate. So don't be surprised when they stumble and their words stutter or they just can't speak. They shut down, they clam up. Don't be surprised. Talking about emotions is actually very, very difficult. It's very hard because it's not just one thing, it's many things. And when you're emotional, you're not thinking from that logical part of your brain. And again, get off your high horse because you do the same thing. When you're emotional, you are stumbling over your words like crazy. And expect emotional people to be nonsensical because your head is really messy right now. And expect them to say sometimes mean things, things that can really hurt your feelings because it's really not them talking. It's really their amygdala, their primal part of the brain is talking. And so when you begin to understand the anatomy of how emotions form here, you're not gonna say things like, oh, people tell the truth when they're emotional. That's not right. You know, your brain, who you are, is the combination of both your amygdala and your prefrontal cortex. And so who you are is really when both parts of those brains are functioning normally. But you're not functioning normally, you're not yourself, when only your amygdala is talking. That's not you. That's just half of you. So no, people are not more truthful when they're emotional. And so when people are emotional, don't take whatever mean things they say seriously, because usually by the time they calm down, you'll find that they meant none of that. But if you make it a big deal, you latch onto it and you make it a thing, then you're gonna start arguing about that. And what was not actually a big deal, you made it into a big deal and now it's just a mess. And the last one is that expect emotional people to not understand why they're emotional, because it's not just one thing. So when you ask someone, why are you so angry? It's not just one answer. It's not a simple answer. It's a complex web of many things that all come together, that all interact, that makes it impossible to answer. And really, whenever someone's very intensely emotional, the only thing you should think is, nothing is wrong with them or their emotions. So again, don't blame character. But you should think, what is going on that's making them feel emotional? And you wanna ask questions and discover what that is and come up with solutions together. And again, this is another example of a good thing that can happen when you stop blaming character and you start blaming environments or systems. And in a future video, I will show you a step-by-step -step plan that you can use to understand how to open your partner up when they're really closed off, when they're really upset, and calming your partner quickly and effectively. So stay tuned for that. But a lot of people then ask like, why should I be the one that has to calm down when my partner is the one that's crazy? Well, that's one way to look at it. But the way I look at it is, this is all the more reason you should do it. Because if you can't do it, if you can't break the cycle, then how can you expect your partner to break the cycle? And if you both can't do it and you're letting your emotions get out of control, then all I have to say to you is like, good luck fighting. Because your relationship will always be filled with so many arguments because neither of you are willing to break that cycle. And the last tip, number five, is avoiding true but useless thoughts, or what I call TBUs. Understand here that our minds are really heavily focused on the negatives. It's biased in that way. Just to illustrate this, Imagine if you're a kid, if you have a child, 
and your kid comes home with this report card, what is the first thing you will comment about? I guarantee you it's always going to be that 1F and you're not going to say a word about that 3A pluses. Because of this, most people love to be stuck in the problem or diagnosis phase. For example, you know, when something is wrong in the relationship, people love it when other people agree that you know, their partner has anger issues, their partner is emotionally unavailable, or their partner is behaving inappropriately. So for example, you, know, uh, you could be going out with your friends and you're talking about all your issues in your relationship and you say, oh, my partner is so crazy. Women are crazy. Then your friends say, oh yeah, they're crazy. Then that makes you happy. You go, yeah, totally, they're crazy. And you just go on and on and on about the problem and we love just talking about the problem and having other people agree with that problem. But the thing is that you know, your problems, your complaints, your blame, your anger, your frustration, your passive aggressiveness, your partner's misbehaviors, their anger issues, their emotional unavailability, and so on, and everything you can think of, they're all true. But what can you do with that information? Nothing. The transfer is always nothing. Because they may be true, but they're really freaking useless. And if you're filling your head with all these problems, talking about the problems with your friends, replaying the problems in your own mind, then your head is going to be in a mess. And so what you need to start doing now, what the most successful couples do, is one, they shift the problem from a problem with people to a problem with environments. We talked about this. And once they do this, they identify the environmental problem. And then they focus on what to do, not on what not to do. So they spin everything in a very positive way. And when you can do this, it really clears your head of all the messy things, of all the ugly things, because you're honing in on instead of a hundred things that are wrong, you're honing in your brain to just the one thing that is right. And this will make you feel a lot more zen. I can tell you that. And am I saying to never dwell on your problems or feel bad about your issues? No. But here's the question I want to ask yourself. After the 17th time you tell the problem to someone or yourself, then ask yourself, how useful is that? And usually the answer is, it's not useful. And when you can do this too, this gets you out of reacting, and usually in a very negative way, to responding, and usually in a more positive way. And in life, anything in life, business, work, relationships, you always want to respond. You never want to just react. So now that you have the five practical tips to manage your own emotions, it doesn't stop there. In fact, that's just a start. Because you want to use the understanding to start to repair and rebuild your relationship and intimacy with your partner. Which is why I've created this five-part video series that will teach you um, to simplify the complicated for one. So this will teach you how to simplify the issues in your relationship and find out the one thing you need to start doing to stop the conflicts once and for all. Because I understand that issues with relationships are rarely just because of one thing, but a complex web of hundreds or thousands of things that has built up over decades. So this module will help you to simplify the mess and give you crystal clear clarity on that one next step you need to start with. Then once you find out what this one thing is, I'll show you the key mindset shifts that my most successful clients make. And once you can make this mindset shift, you'll be like seeing for the first time and everything will begin to change for you and taking the next step will become much easier. Then finally, the rest of the modules here, I will show you my five step system that allows you to resolve the most painful issues in your relationship. And these are the same five step system that I use with hundreds of my clients to get them to stop arguments for good and to control their emotions for good. And so if you're interested in this course, the link to this course is in the description box below this video. And if you want a safe space where you can talk about the issues in your relationship and actually get good advice about it, you can join our Facebook group as well. And this Facebook group is filled with people who are just as passionate and just as serious about mastering their relationship as much as you are. And the link to join this Facebook group is also below this video. So if you like this video, then go ahead and click that like button and subscribe to this channel. And tell us, which of these five tips did you find most helpful? Leave a comment below. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this. And for now, I hope to see you in the next video.